This is my Wahoo kicker bike, and over the last year I have trained on this, I've raced on it, I've won on it, in fact, I've even crashed on it. <laughs> and now it is, it's f actually, it's completely 100% April last year is when it arrived, and my plan was in a few weeks' time to do a 12-month review, but it has died early. Last night was my final ever ride on it. Tomorrow it gets taken apart, gets stuck into those boxes back there, and it gets sent back to Wahoo, which is actually going to be really quite sad. Until they send me a new one the week after. So, having tested it to destruction, literally, Let's review it now, and I'm going to do this in four parts. Part one is how I've used it, part two, what I like, part three, what I don't like, and then part four, what's happened to it and what's going to happen next. So how have I used it? Well, when I got it, it was to supplement my running mainly, but also to take the place of some of my gym work because the gyms were starting to close down because of coronavirus. I had not ridden a road bike before. In fact, apart from the occasional mountain bike ride in the countryside for a picnic, I hadn't really been on a bike since I was a kid. So I was very new to it all and I loved it immediately. So did my wife, so did my two youngest kids. We've all used it. I am six foot six and between 220 and 230 pounds. So that's about just over 100 kilos. My wife is 5'6", about 120. One of my kids is 6'7". It fits us all fine and has had plenty of use. Wahoo lists the size of riders that will suit it from 5 foot to 6 foot 4, up to 113 kilos, which is about 250 pounds. So technically two of us are too tall for the bike, but that would only really affect us in terms of making it uncomfortable to ride, and it doesn't. Neither of us are at the top end of the maximum weight, which of course will be a bigger deal for the bike. I use it at least three times a week. I've done four hour long rides on it. I've done 100 mile rides on it. So it's not getting commercial levels of use, but it is certainly getting used every day. And most of that is pretty low intensity stuff. For example, 90% of what I do on it is long, steady rides between 250 and 300 watts. So pretty low impact. Now, in case you're thinking all cycling is low impact, not so much. Last year, most of my training on it was done on Trainer Road or Sufferfest because I was in preparation for an Ironman in Hamburg this year. But at the end of last year, when it became pretty obvious that that wasn't going to be taking place this year, I switched across to doing more fun Zwift races. And that involved sprint finishes. And then at the beginning of this year, I started racing in the Zwift Racing League. And some of those rides actually have specific sprint sections within the Zwift race. Now, I'm not a strong cyclist by any normal measure. I race in category C, and I do my best to try and be in the top half of that middle group. But I am large. I can hold a 1,000 watt sprint for about 30 seconds. I can peak at around 1,500 watts. So it's fair to say there are some forces going through the bike. Now, Wahoo say it will generate resistance up to 2,000 watts. And as I said, I'm inside the maximum weight. But compared to the typical cyclist, I'm probably applying some above average exertions. So what do I like about it? Almost everything. It is probably one of my favorite bits of fitness kit. It's certainly one of my most used pieces. To be able to just come in here any other day, jump on it and do a Zwift race with hundreds of other people, it's just awesome fun. If anything, I've overused it on occasion. It's sometimes quite hard on a rest day to not resist just coming in here and jumping on and doing a quick 10K race. It also looks really good. I did a video a few weeks back on my subscribers' own Zwift setups, and this bike in front of a big-ass TV just looks good. If it has to be on view in your house, it is a much slicker-looking proposition than a regular bike hooked up to a trainer. It's also pretty quiet in use, which again is important if you're using it in a spare room in a house or something. For me, in here, in the garage, what it looks like, what it sounds like is largely irrelevant right now. But later this year, my eldest son is planned to move out and I'll be starting the conversion of his bedroom into my Zwift and YouTube editing space the second the last of his Harry Potter posters comes down and he drives off into the sunset. At that point, it looking like it fits into an environment that's going to be a cross between some sort of 
Batcave and a home gym from MTV Cribs is gonna be really important to me. Now, adjustability. It is a big selling feature of the bike that you can change its shape and size really easily, and it just works. My 14-year-old can come in here after I've been on it, and in 20 seconds, he has shrunk the bike down and he's off and he's riding. You can even go so far as to adjust the crank length if you want, we don't bother changing it between riders. But in summary, unless you are a very odd shaped human being, you're gonna be able to get it dialed in for you. Now, the Wi-Fi techie side of things, 99% of the time just works perfectly. We'll discuss the other 1% in a bit. Initially, you use the Wahoo app on your phone to get it set up and configured. I have the gearing, for example, set up so that it mirrors my Cervelo P3X triathlon bike. But after that, most people are going to use the Bluetooth or the Ant Plus technology on it to communicate with whatever they're running their training software on, whether that's a phone, iPad, MacBook like I use, computer, Apple TV, the choice is yours. You could work out using the Wahoo app. But with things like Zwift and Sufferfest and Trainer Road, you're probably missing a trick by not using those types of software instead. It will also communicate simultaneously with something like Garmin, that's how I use it. I have a Garmin Edge cycling computer that receives the data so that my Garmin metrics are all up to date at the same time as the bike is also communicating with Zwift so that my little cartoon cyclist is doing his thing as well. You can even communicate with two types of software at once. In the past, I've used a Trainer Road fixed program to just follow along, while at the same time, my little Zwift avatar has been taking the information to just ride his way through the Zwift world and tot up my Zwift mileage at the same time. Okay, the tilt. Again, another huge selling point of the bike. It tilts up and down. And I almost forgot that it tilts up and down until I watched back videos of myself riding it and realize that I'm literally going up and down as the bike's going up and down hills. It's completely immersive. I thought it might be a little bit of a gimmick at first, and to be fair, on things like Trainer Road and Sufferfest, it's largely irrelevant. But when you get onto Zwift and you hit some undulations in the route, and you can literally feel the bike rolling up and down over those bumps, it's as close to riding outside as you can get inside. Actually, talking of realism, I should add that mine sits on a rocker plate which I'm not going to review because it's not part of the bike. But go back and check out my rocker plate video because it is part of the experience. It takes the sensation of being on a real bike to another level. And it also makes riding long sessions way more comfortable and forgiving, much more so than being in a static position. So rocker plate recommended. Customer service is superb. I've contacted them a few times about different issues and they've always got back to me very, very quickly by email. They've made sure my issue was resolved. They've even followed up afterwards to check there was no ongoing problems. And to be fair to them, most of my problems only arose because I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And reading online as well, it seems that most people have a similar experience. There are very, very few complaints about the level of customer service from their help desk. And lastly, build quality. The bits they've got right, they have got very right. It all feels very premium, very well made. All the materials are quality. I've sweated all over it for a year and there's nothing rusting on it. Once a month, I give it a wipe down. It looks as good as new again. Now, for £3,000, you'd expect them to use premium materials, but at least it meets those expectations. And now let's do the things that I don't like. Although actually, let's start with things that I don't really care about, but other people seem to not like. Online, you'll see a lot of people complaining about the quality of the saddle, the bars, and even the pedals. They'll say that for a bike of this price, those components are cheap. Who cares? No one is riding this thing on standard flat pedals. You're gonna put your own pedals on there for clipless shoes. I think I sat on the standard saddle, which is this, about three times before I swapped it out for one that matches my Cervelo road bike. And the same with the front end. I swapped the bars over recently for ones that were just much more comfortable for me. I think that keeping the price of the bike down with these cheap components that I'm gonna swap anyway is a benefit, not a disadvantage. The alternative would be a more expensive bike with expensive components that if they don't suit you, you're still gonna swap anyway. This is a better way of doing it as far as I'm concerned. So let's do some things that I really don't like. Let's do some minor ones first. These are just things that could easily be tweaked to improve a future model, for example. First up, the power lead. Everyone is gonna be using this thing facing a wall with a TV screen on it, 
which means your power source is going to be in front of you. So it's mildly annoying that the bike gets plugged into its power source at the back end. It's only mildly annoying, it just means that you have the wire running underneath the bike, I've had to zip tie mine up out of the way. The bigger deal is that the power block lead is only long enough to leave that power block sat right underneath the part where you sweat all over it. I've actually extended the lead on mine so that my power block sits right up out of the way, doesn't get sweat all over anymore, but I shouldn't have to do that. It just seems to be rather ill thought out on their part. Talking of wiring, the front end. In this era of modern bikes with all their wiring being concealed and hidden away, it's just a bit of a mess. Again, I've done my own tidying up with zip ties and electrical tape to make it as neat as possible, but it's not ideal. Really, it should be hidden away, concealed inside the bike somehow, which doesn't look like it'd be that hard to achieve, and then pop up under here and plug in in a much more discreet fashion. And talking of plugging in the wires, the box down here that they plug into is not ideally placed. It's only got really two purposes. One is to lock the tilting mechanism and the other is to display you the gear you're in. But because it's underneath the part where again you're sweating all over it, you either sweat all over it or as I've done here, you cover it up with a towel or a sweat cover and then can't see what gear you're in. Again, it doesn't seem like it'd be too complicated to relocate that unit and at least put the gear change information somewhere more obviously viewable up on top of the bars would be ideal noise. Now I said earlier that it runs quietly. It does almost all the time, but very occasionally it will make from the back end a weird sort of mechanical whining, whaley sort of noise. Wahoo say they all do that, sir. So they aren't bothered. It's not a problem with the bike, but it is a bit odd when it does it. If your cadence is just right and your speed is just right to cause it to happen, you'll know it because the thing will go full on Finding Nemo. <laughs> Okay, some slightly bigger issues. The adjustability that I mentioned earlier is great, is great, but it comes at a price. When you extend the saddle right the way back here as I have it, you end up with some movement in those sections that is not ideal. The same happens at the front end as well. If you shrink the bike down, push this in, lock it off, that is now rock solid and going nowhere. But as soon as you extend that back out again, locked off but there's some wiggle in there it's only going to be larger riders that encounter that problem but unfortunately larger riders tend to be heavier and therefore we appreciate a little bit more sturdidity sturdidity sturdiness in our ride it also applies on the up standing part here as well again when it's shrunk right the way down it's rock solid like that but you extend it right to the maximum it doesn't move the same way that the back end does, but you have got two pieces of metal there joined together with a sliding mechanism. No matter how well they engineer that, there is movement. It generates some creaking and groaning noises that are just unavoidable. Now, Wahoo have some official guidance on lubrication and so on, I've done all that. No matter what you do to it, it doesn't feel rock solid. It feels good, but not rock solid. And talking of adjustment, the most complained about fault with the bike that I ever read online is the quick release for the saddle adjustment and the bars adjustment. As standard, they come with typical quick release levers that no one ends up very happy with. You ride the bike, especially if you're heavy, the saddle will drop down, the bars will drop down. The official solution from Wahoo is to remove the saddle, remove the bars, over tighten the clamps, leave them overnight, and when you put them back in, they'll be nice and snug. That appears to be a solution that is more official than successful though. Most people still encounter problems. I encountered sufficient problems that I ended up snapping the quick release here. Hence, I have just a standard nut and bolt. And I snapped the quick release up front. Hence, I replaced it with another quick release because I do need to adjust that for my kid to use it. If it was just me using the bike, I'd put nuts and bolts on both of these. I'd then get someone to weld all the joints solid and shut like the doors on the General Lee. Okay, up top, the buttons on the hoods don't do as much as they could do. In fact, they do very little at all. 
it largely depends on what software you're running. Zwift have recently introduced steering and the buttons can turn you left and right, but more useful will be things like changing the camera angle or activating power-ups, and they can't do that. And that's really an issue for the third-party software makers. It's not Wahoo's fault, but what is Wahoo's fault is not being able to turn them off. For example, when I was riding on Sufferfest, I would find that the buttons on the inside of the hoods are too easy to press, and in fact, I would accidentally press them and turn erg mode off and on, which completely messed up my training. To such an extent, I'd pull the wires from the bottom out completely and just not have the hoods running at all. There's even a guy on YouTube who's done a tutorial on how to take these hoods apart and get at the switch and make the switches less sensitive to accidental touching. What would be a real solution is if Wahoo let you just go into the app on your phone and turn the buttons off or on as required. Okay, now before I get to the big one, and this is just a very particular complaint to me, I'd like it to be a little bit wider. I find that when I'm stood up on it and sprinting hard, the width of the track at the back means it rocks a little bit excessively. I've even had my kid stand on it in the past when I've been doing hard sprints but I'm being very fussy because there isn't really a wider option on the market. And I solved the problem by clamping it down to my rocker plate, to be honest, unless you're also six foot six and heavy and sprinting really hard, you're never gonna notice that. Okay, the big one. These break. Whether yours will break or not is hard to say. If you join the Wahoo Kicker Bike Facebook group, you will come to the conclusion that they all break eventually, but that is a very unfair way to judge the situation. There are really only two reasons why anybody would ever join a Facebook group for a product. One, they have an issue with their product. Two, I don't know, they like memes, they're lonely, I've got no idea. I joined with a really minor issue and I was amazed at how many people I was reading about getting full replacement bikes being sent to them. And it seemed to get worse as winter came on, people complaining about the bikes not running in the cold, if they're in a cold garage, electrical issues, the bikes wouldn't tilt backwards and forwards. People were even putting their power blocks on a radiator in the house to warm them up before they rode the bike. In fact, there were so many complaints, you'd have assumed it was user error if it weren't for the fact that Wahoo were sending out brand new bikes to these people with these problems. Now, it may be that Wahoo sell zillions of these things, and the number of people complaining on the Facebook group is a minute percentage of the total sold. That that group unfairly represents the normality that everyone's problems are terminal. That's what I thought when I joined with what was a really minor Bluetooth issue, and I felt like I joined a, a Facebook group on people with headaches, and I was the only person there with just a headache. Everyone else had six months to live and was working through their bucket list. And then, mine died too, and I hadn't even taken it skydiving. So what's happened to it and what happens next? Well, its problems emerged towards the end of last year with some worryingly mechanical sounded noises that grew to huge clunks during hard sprints. Something was seriously wrong at the back end. It felt like a chain was slipping on a regular bike. So it was clunking, it was creaking, then I started to have electrical dropouts, both the Ant Plus and the Bluetooth would stop, I'd have to literally unplug the bike to plug it back in again to re-establish connection, then the gear change wouldn't work, and then last night's ride, which I knew was going to be the final ride, had all of that. It was like the bike knew that it was on its way out, it had seen the boxes arrive and just hung in there for one last go. And regular viewers who are thinking that this video has been a bit light on movie clips, that's because I've saved them all up for now because I can't quite decide which one best summarizes this poor thing's demise. Last night's race was the Bolt Team Championships. It's the Bolt race team that I ride in the Zwift League for. They had all their teams pitted against each other in an over 40 kilometer ride that had a sprint section, a couple of climbs. It had the lot, it was a tough ride. And the bike was great for the first 20 kilometers. I even got top points for the fastest sprint. And then in the second half, it just started to fall apart. Almost literally the bike started to fall apart. 
it was clunking, it was creaking, I had electrical gremlins going on, I couldn't change gear, all the while I'm sat on top of it feeling like I'm about to pass out and gutted that I'm not doing better. It was dying and its death had all the horror of quince, <laughs> the mechanical failings of gooses, and it had the emotional anguish of Sergeant Elias. That's not true, nothing has that much emotional anguish. In the end, I crossed the line in an above average position with my sprint points and above average score. I couldn't change gear for the last eight kilometers. The thing gave its life for me to get to the end effectively. It was all very Gene Hackman in the Poseidon adventure. You can make it! So what happens now? Well now it goes in the box and it goes back to Wahoo and they send me a new one. As I said, their customer service is spot on. In summary, do I recommend the Wahoo kicker bike still? Yes, 100% I do. I am a very large rider, riding very aggressively at times. Now, according to the Wahoo specs, I should fit within what it's able to tolerate, but even so, you could put an elite cyclist on it doing 400 plus watts for a steady two or three hours, they still aren't gonna put anything like the stresses on the bike that I put on it over a 30 second sprint. So it's not had the easiest of lives. And to be fair to Wahoo, they do seem very, very good at keeping their customers happy. If they offered me now a full refund, my money back, I could go and buy a different bike, I'd say, no, thank you, I will take another one. Should you? Yes, if you can afford it, because it's not cheap, but its ability to combine exercise with an immersive experience that just extends way beyond the garage or the spare room that you're training in is second to none. It just makes exercise, staying fit, staying healthy, fun to do. I got it, I wasn't a cyclist and I am now. I can't give it greater praise than that. It's turned me into a cyclist. Just make sure you keep the receipt and you join the Facebook group. It's the Facebook group for the Wahoo Kicker Bike. Do not join the Headache Facebook group. That place is terrifying.